Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the NASCAR Heat 5 Clint Boyer season mode. We're on to race number 21 from Kentucky, one of the fallen racetracks from the 2020 season. And I have a bit of a funny story to tell about getting this race set up. Uh, when it comes to my television monitor, the one that I use to actually play the game on, this one's to record on, this one over here is to actually play the game. So it seemed like every time I would walk out of this room, the TV would shut off. But then when I would walk back in, the TV would turn back on. So even though this TV is actually nine years old, I had a duh moment and thought that like, oh, maybe it just has motion detection. <laughs> but what was actually happening was there was a wire in the back of my computer, the HDMI cable that goes to this TV was loose. And every time that I would shake the floor by walking past it back in, it would come back on. Every time that I would leave, it would shut off. And I, this has been going on for like two weeks now that I've been just th thinking that this nine-year-old television got like a hardware update in the middle of the night while I wasn't seeing someone from Samsung. I don't even know if they had the same ownership as they did nine years ago. Came in, installed motion detection in this TV. But anyway, I digress. We currently have eight wins on the season. We're first in points. Had a bit of a, a string of tough luck. I guess you could say at Pocono, Pocono, and Indianapolis. Uh, by the way, I've kind of made my decision on the best uh, track in the state of Pennsylvania. It has to be Williams Grove, doesn't it? I mean, it almost has to be. Uh, anyway, huge point gap above Martin Truex Jr., who runs second in points. Joey Logano currently resides third. Kyle Busch in fourth. And Ryan Newman in fifth. Those are your playoff standings, but if we switch to point standings... Kyle Busch actually has the second most points, but Martin Truex Jr. having two wins puts him above Kyle Busch in the standings. Kevin Harvick, in the actual point standings, resides fourth without a win so far. Ryan Newman scored a win earlier this season. He currently runs in fifth, and Kurt Busch is in sixth without a win. On the outside looking in, we have Kenseth, Reddick, Johnson, Stenhouse, and Elliott, and those who need a win... Custer, Suarez, Jones, McLeod, and Christopher Bell. And to update you on the last car championship. Currently, Joey Gase leads that battle. And the lowest driver with a win is Bubba Wallace in 27th. So keep your eye on that 30th place position in points. So now let's get on to Kentucky. And I forgot. It's time for Festivus. I hope you're enjoying your happy merriment season. Whatever holiday that may be. So as you can tell with the setup, we're going one up on the loose meter. Uh, but I am going to tighten the car up just a little bit once we get into the race. Uh, I kind of like the, the tightness to be in between the slider, but the slider is a good, I guess you could say, base for the setup. It's, they never really have very good setups, and I think that's so that you learn how to actually make a good setup. I don't really have the time to do that, so I just make in-race adjustments to make the car better. Uh, so my plan is to go a little bit up on the wedge to tighten the car up. Some more front end tape to get the car a little bit more comfortable mid-corner. But uh, I did a test race here earlier today, you know, in single player. And what I learned about Kentucky is you see that yellow line on the inside of turn one? Well, the seam actually to the right of that is really where the line should be because below there, you kind of have this drop off and the car wants to spin out you know like a lot of tracks in this game there's kind of hidden seams that if you hit those the car wants to spin out in fact this is the only track where I've noticed this in this game there's a seam on the front stretch that wants the car to spin out and uh, it's one of the few times I've actually lost the car in a straightaway in this game so I don't expect for this lap to be very good because you know, the last few weekends in this game, I've been, you know, running Chicago, Pocono, Pocono Indy. Not not my best tracks, and neither is Kentucky. I'm waiting to get towards the playoffs when we start to... You know, return to some better racetracks like Bristol, Martinsville, places like that. The core of the sport. Anyway, 19th position. Yeah. Who won the poll, though? Brat BJ. Second. I mean, even Ross Chastain, 13th, is surprising. John Hunter out-qualified me. 
Uh, and David Reagan, dead last. Let's hope that Joey Gase doesn't win last car. Somebody drop back, because now we're starting 18th. Here's your top stories entering Kentucky. We have Ross Chastain being dominant all weekend, huh? Ooh, Kyle Busch had to change. He finished dead last in the last race in Indianapolis, uh, which is why my point gap got so big above him, even though I just finished third and I threw away one stage at Indy, but I did win the other. So uh, I'd say that with the bad luck of Kyle Busch so far, we're, we're getting pretty lucky this time of the season. Anyway, here we go. I paused to fix the recording setup a little bit. I was a little bit worried about the webcam still being selected. I use OBS if anyone's curious how I record these videos. Same software I use for the NR2003 videos I do. Probably the best recording software you could get for free. Uh, I've I've played around with like the free trials of Fraps as well, but I've noticed that the way Fraps records, I have a very hard time getting it into the video editor I use, Sony Vegas. Normally, it, it turns out pretty weird. So we're up in the 17th spot. Let's see, we have 14 laps on gas and about 18 laps in the stage left, so we will have to make at least one pit stop. I don't think I'm really going to score very many points, if any, in this stage, just because, you know, the car's bad. Uh, very similar track to Chicago. I have a little bit better luck at Kansas, but Chicago was just, I don't know, the car was off the whole time, and uh, getting ready for a similar experience here. I've seen some people do pretty good in this game at, at uh, Kentucky, but I've just never been able to figure it out. However, a track that you don't really see too many people do good at New Hampshire, I have figured out. So, uh, take notes, I guess. It'll be the next race, so. But uh, with, with my standards, I'll probably end up wrecking out of that race. But uh, 704 tweeted out a question to their followers recently. What is your least favorite track in NASCAR Heat 5? I'd say, for me, it's probably Pocono. Either Pocono or Texas. I, you know, both of those tracks have the massive, you know, AI wrapping the bottom problem. But actually, it's probably worse at Texas. Uh, it's kind of funny, though, when you look at all the comments to that tweet, you know, that question. A lot of people are in agreement about what the worst tracks are. It's, you know, it's always Pocono. It's always Texas. There's a lot of agreement in that question. And you, you know, you never see agreement in a NASCAR question on Twitter. But in that case, there is. And it's, it's amazing when you can get a unanimous decision on something like that. Kind of shows you you have to work on something, doesn't it? So this car is a little free for my standards right now. That's why, as the run goes on, I want to tighten the thing up because, yeah, it's uh, it's kind of doing the four-wheel slide thing. Not like the rear end's trying to snap, but like the whole thing's just sliding. And it's not pushing either because that's, that's when the front end wants to push. Dibby. Okay. Bowman just took the lead off Truex. By the way, BJ qualified second. Look at where he is. He's in 12th spot. You know, it's kind of a shame that Kentucky shut down for, for one really big reason. It's because they they put in so much effort to repave and reconfigure this place in 2016 that uh, it's kind of like they're never going to make their money back for, uh, for, for going through all that effort. I don't know what you guys think is, is the most disappointing track that, that will be lost for 2021. Um, when it comes to an individual track, I say Chicago is the one that I'm going to miss the most, but when it comes to a certain layout, it has to be by far Indianapolis. And, you know, I don't really like the races there anyway. I think that NASCAR should, should leave that track in its entirety. But, you know, it kind of did mean something when, when NASCAR went there. 
you know, because it's, it's pretty much the most famous racetrack on Earth, uh, with maybe the exception of uh, the Monaco GP circuit. Maybe. And, and that's debatable. Uh, but still. Well, we're going to make it to the end of the stage now. But Indy was never suited for stock cars, and that's, you know, because it wasn't built for them. But uh, then again, when you think about it in the modern day, Indy wasn't built for, for Indy cars <laughs> in a way, because, you know, if you look at the cars that they used to run back there in 1909, there's no way you can tell me that they're an IR-18. Okay? There, there's no way. But, uh, you know, IndyCar can just, they can pull it off, and stock cars can't. But still, you know, it, it meant something. It was more sentimental than it was, uh, not sentimental, it was more symbolic than it was entertaining. But, uh, it's a little disappointing to see it go. I'd much rather have IRP. <laughs> that's, that's my personal opinion, because uh, IRP is underrated as I'll get out, although I don't think that the track promoters quite have the money to, you know, put on a cup race, but NASCAR needs to lower their guard. You know, since no fans are allowed in the stands anyway, why are you concerned about crowd size? You know what I mean? Why are you concerned about the amount of people you can fit in the grandstands when, depending on state, you can fit zero? You know, it feels like now is not the time to be concerned about attendance. Now's the time to be concerned about whether or not you can get people to tune in on television. Oh, and also, I want to talk sponsorship. So, you know, NASCAR has been talking about moving the numbers back, farther back, you know, giving the sponsor probably like, what, 5% more space to advertise. So NASCAR's trying to do that, enticing all this money to come flowing right in, right? And uh, yesterday... PepsiCo announced their departure of Hendrick Motorsports, meaning that they're not even willing to sponsor both the most popular driver and the defending champion. Don't you think there's something wrong with this picture? When, you know, a giant sponsor like PepsiCo, in fact, I'm drinking one. That's a Diet Pepsi right there. You can really tell how healthy I look. But anyway, when a giant sponsor like Pepsi isn't willing to sponsor both the best and most popular driver in NASCAR at, at your present time, do you really think moving the number back is going to fix your problem? You know, is that number that important when it comes to losing giant corporations due to no one in the stands giving a crap? Because listen, the sponsors don't just get in for the sake of getting in. They join these cars, they sponsor these cars and these tracks so that they can get the fans to look at them and know their brand. You know, Coca-Cola is not a premier partner of NASCAR just to say that they are. They're a premier partner so that more people drink Coca-Cola. And who are those people who would know? The people in the stands or the ones watching on TV. That's the whole point of sponsorship. But NASCAR doesn't get it, I don't think. I think that they see sponsors as just something that you have. It's just something you get. It's not something that has purpose to them, is what I'm trying to say. And uh, by them losing their eyes on what's actually most important, the fans giving a crap, that is what's hurting them. That is why they're going straight into the toilet is because if you lose sight of your fans, then the sponsors don't want to sponsor you because there's no one watching the sport. What's the point in sponsoring something that nobody watches? Anyway, 15th in the stage, absolutely no points. That's not very good. It's just not very good for my standards. I'm going to back down the wedge adjustment a little bit because the car was getting a little tight. Either that or I was just ranting a little bit too much. Anyway, to further my discussion about soda, though, right. let's talk about Dr. Pepper coming in. Uh, I mean, it doesn't really feel like they left, but I guess they kind of did. Because, you know, it's been a little while since BK Racing. But I sense conspiracy between uh, Dr. Pepper and Denny Hamlin's new team. 
you know why. So they are going to be fielding the number 23 for Bubba Wallace next season. And how many flavors does Dr. Pepper have in it? 23. I mean, it's genius marketing. It, it really is. Uh, they did it with the BK cars already, you know, the number 23 that they used to have. But it's kind of amazing how they reunited like that by accident, the number and, and the sponsorship. It's, it's perfect, really. It's like if 84 Lumber just just so happened to sponsor a number 84. Not because they thought it would be good marketing, but because they just believed in the team. You know what I mean? It's like they didn't really sponsor them for any particular reason but the number. Uh, and, you know, obviously it's a very easily marketable team with uh, so many eyes on it, you know, being founded by a famous uh, NBA player and uh, now a practically pulp cu pop culture celebrity in Bubba Wallace, which, uh, you know, it, it is great to see for that organization. You know, it'll get a lot of, of marketing and eyes on it. But uh, in a way, I guess the problem is, is that I'm worried about that organization being the Danica of teams, meaning that they have so much hype coming into them and then they're probably just going to fall flat on their face. That's what I'm worried about because, uh, you know, obviously I'm, I'm not saying the driver can't do it. Bubba's proven he can win in, in, you know, the truck series before. But so did Stacy Compton. Uh, you know, it's nothing against the driver. The driver can do it, but it, the whole team needs to be good. It can't just be a good driver because Stacy's a good driver. You know, Stacy was talented. He just got into Melling Racing about 30 years too late. You know, what was it, 2001 when he drove for Melling? Remember that they won the 1988 championship. So, you know, that's only about 15 years, but but still it was uh, far too late for Melling to be any good. I think Harry Melling by that point had already passed away and that was, you know, the team founder. Unless you count back when it was just the Elliott family team as uh, Bill's father founding it. I forget his name. Bill Elliott's father. Was it Was it George? Is that right? Feels right for some reason. Anyway, high hopes for uh, 2311, but I have a strange suspicion that they will not be Furniture Row. I feel like they will be more like what Levine was for those two years they got with Toyota. Because isn't, isn't that what 2311 is going to get, is Levine's cars? Oh, God, Newman. And, you know, Levine equipment, it was good enough to almost win Bristol in 2019. They finished third at Texas in October 2020. But can't really call it championship contending now, can you? You know, it's not Furniture Row. I don't know, I'd like to hear what, what people watching this think... Uh, think 2311 is going to do because I would say that a race win in their first season would be a bit of a stretch. Uh, second season, if all goes well, yeah, I'd say that they could. But uh, but first season, I think, is, is a bit of a stretch. It really all depends on how their first season goes. If it goes terribly, they might just end up to be another Toyota team that kicks the bucket, which, you know, we've, we've been seeing that a lot in the last 10 years. Red Bull, BK... Uh, Michael Waltrip, Furniture Row, Levine, Bill Davis. You know, almost every Toyota team that has existed up to this date. Jermaine left Toyota and then closed, though. So they, they were at least a little bit unique about how they did it. But so far, we're down to Gaunt 2311 and Joe Gibbs. And, you know, Gibbs is the only team that they really help, <laughs> to be completely honest with you. I don't know why there's so much favoritism. Out of TRD, man, I was I was trying to wreck Kurt Busch there, and he would not budge. But anyway, the favoritism out of TRD is what I don't like. You know, Toyota could be really successful if they were a little bit more like Ford, had a sensible driver development program, and uh, you know, actually worked to better themselves and their and their teams. 
instead of just uh, throw all the money at Joe and kind of leave everyone else to, to fend, fend on their own, you know? Fuel save? Is that the method? Is that the method for this now? I'm willing to try it. I'm outside of a point earning position, so I might as well throw something at it. You know, it doesn't matter whether I finish 13th or 40th. I get the same amount of points, so... You know what? Screw it. I'm going to save gas. I got the strategy down. I tell you. I got them strats. I stole this playbook off Chad Knauss. Actually, that's, prob that's probably incorrect. I don't think he'd be willing to try something this aggressive. I stole this off of Matt McCall, actually. That's where I got this from. It seems like when I go into fuel save mode, I, like, progressively get slower. Like, my mind pushes me less and less. All right, so now we got cars coming down. You're almost out of gas. Oh, I'm up to 13th. It's kind of like how far should you be willing to stretch it, if you know what I mean? Just, just riding around right now. I'm on a very nice Sunday drive. It's smooth. It's comfortable. The scenery's nice. I've got one lap to go. Timmy Hill just took the lead and ran out. Watch those tires. You're almost out of gas. I'm committed to only running at six grand. Meters pitting. So Timmy Hill's gonna pit right here, but it's very possible he could beat me. So now the car's sputtering. Outside, outside. Up, stay okay. Second. Good enough. Timmy Hill wins the stage. All I wanted was a couple stage points. I think we might have lapped some guys, so... Success? Uh, I don't think we really lapped anybody. I don't know. I got second. Scored some stage points. That's probably about the highlight of the race. But I will say this. If anybody's watching this, try more aggressive fuel-saving strategies if you suck at a racetrack. You might get some points. So anyway, final stage, we got 15 laps estimated fuel, 25 laps remaining in the race. Still there. I can't quite as easily turn this into a fuel mileage race as I can with the stage. Look at Bowman. Actually, I think we trapped all the good cars in the back, which is very convenient. Like, you see that mess that's <laughs> forming up there? Right towards the, w the lead, I think uh, Kenseth and possibly Eric Jones are battling for it. Yeah, it's Eric. Isn't uh, K 
Kentucky 2017, the weekend that they announced that Eric Jones was going to replace Matt Kenseth? Kind of funny. Uh, you know, it's all it's all looped right back into place. I mean, the car's feeling pretty good, but once I get up to, like, 15th, it just it can't do anything, you know? So we are going to get probably at least one caution in this stage. I just wonder when and how, because we're probably going to get one yellow, and we certainly have to pit at least once. So when do I make my pit stop? Because I, I want to plan it around a caution that I don't know when that's going to come out. Here comes De Benedetto with uh, some of that classic bottom ripping. Look at how high some of these guys are running the line, like the 10 and the 48. I mean, this is that's that's too high for Kentucky in the modern day. That might have worked pre-repave like in 2015, but that's just too much. You know, I like stage racing in NASCAR. I really do. I think it's a, a great idea to hand out points mid-race, but I don't really like the cautions because it makes, it makes the crew chief's job way too easy, number one, and number two, it just makes the race predictable. You know, if you know exactly when a caution's going to fall, then you know exactly when you're going to pit, you know? I liked, you know, back in mainly the COT era, back when kind of the racing was starting to suck a little. And I'm talking the winged COT era. 2011, 2012, that was great. But the winged COT era. The fuel mileage races, they were still good. You know, and there was, there was some exceptions, you know, back in the COT era of a race that was just good. You know, uh, it doesn't matter what type of car you run, there's really never going to be such a thing as a bad race at Martinsville, except for 2019, but that was a different story. I'm talking both races. I'm looking at you, Brad and Martin. But uh, the COT, it was actually great at Martinsville. It really was. Uh, and what I've always found most confusing is the COT was modeled in a way off of the Camping World truck. And the truck series never really had any of the problems that the COT did. And, you know, obviously the biggest reason in retrospect was probably that giant wing. You know, that, that kind of made it undrivable in traffic. And by the way, I've dropped to 21st. I need to tighten this car back up. You saw I went down on the wedge. That, why, why did that right side lap counter go ghost mode? Did you see that? It was like transparent. It's it's never normally like that. But anyway, car's sliding. And I gotta fix that. It was like really good at the beginning of the run. But then, you know, of course, it would just fall off a cliff. Which is, you know, how degradation works. But, but still, I need to be good at the end of a run, not at the beginning. I'm having the uh, the Kurt Busch problem of, you know, our cars are great to start, completely fall apart by the end. Look at Matt Kenseth, by the way. He's, he's like, put a separation above the field at this point. You see where the 42 car is on the mini-map and then the rest of the field. I think there's a small gaggle of cars running behind Kenseth. But, but he's mainly by himself. Trying to run down JJ right here. Stay low, stay low. Okay. This is my opportunity. Tighten the car back up. Tape. I'm not crazy. I'm putting on that much tape. We lost two spots. That's all right. My pit crew really couldn't screw me over here because I was already in the back. If I was out front, we would have dropped to 23rd. Because I was in 21st, they didn't feel the need to drop the ball on me. I mean, when, when you're running with Bobby Carter, you know you're doing a good job. I was a little bit below where I should have been running right there. I was kind of worried the car was going to spin out. Tell you what, Reality's champion is not driving like a champion in this, in this playthrough. 
currently outside the playoffs, actually, but that's probably because of all the weird winners we've had. But still, he has yet to rise to the occasion. And we're getting pretty darn close to the playoffs at this point. Look at McLeod cutting through the field. Let's hope Matt Kenseth can bring her home, huh? Well, there he goes all the way up to the top, so probably, probably not going to do it after pulling a move like that. But he kept the lead. I feel like I'm, I'm just announcing this race, like I'm not really in it. Because you know, when you're running around 17th, this is kind of like the real-life Clint Boyer simulator. All right, the temp's getting a little high, but the tires are going to degrade, which will lead to me starting to lift a whole lot more. All right, I forced McLeod wide, but here comes Christopher. Eight laps to go. I've, I've more or less stalled out. Like, this car cannot really do much more than 18th. And now, you know, obviously it's getting a little warm. But that's because I got Gabe Hardy with the, with the tape. Still there. Okay, that, that, that right there was car control. I'm just saying that that's like a perfect example of how not to wreck. I'm trying not to use the brake any, so the car stays cool. Uh, obviously, I'm having, you know... Oh, wreck! Somebody blew up. Well, actually, more like somebody blew a tire and spun in front of the field. I should have checked who that was, because that might be important for the points. But anyway, here we go. Late race restart. I can't quite Kurt Busch it from this distance. Or Cole Custer it. But uh, uh, if I can cut in. I keep hopping that seam on the restarts. It's killing my momentum. Momentum. Careful, still there. Yeah, you just got to get up on in there. Kenseth, why are you got taking t turns three and four wide? You're ruining this for yourself. Look, he's running the straightaway on the top. Loose. I mean, it's still loose, even knowing that this car should logically be pushing. Park the bus for 14th. Matt Kenseth's going to win it. Kenseth locks himself in with a win at Kentucky. Good job. Because, <laughs> I mean, he goes from the bottom to the top now because I think he was actually outside of the playoff running order. So good work for the 42. I'll be completely honest with you. That was one of the least fun races of the season uh, as a driver. As a, uh, I guess, announcer, <laughs> which was what I was doing for most of the race, was just yapping. I actually enjoyed it because I got a lot of time to talk about random subjects. Anyway, Martin Truex Jr. actually finished second, which isn't very good for me. Neither is Kyle Busch finishing in eighth spot. But Matt Kenseth winning, that's good news. Because he might be another guy who could be a round one elimination driver. And let's see, who brought it home in dead last? Justin Haley, look at Kevin Harvick dropping out with seven laps to go. So he was the one who wrecked up in front of the field. Anyway, I have a huge point lead above Martin Truex Jr. And as you can tell, Truex has moved back up into second. Kyle Busch drops down to third. Uh, and Kevin Harvick's dropped all the way down to seventh. Matt Kenseth now with a win, 14th in points. Bubba is still 27th. And dead last, Joey Gase. So Matt Kenseth had the fastest lap and went on to win the race, so 
definitely did something with the speed and led the most laps too. Kind of weird that he, you know, starts the season pretty bad and finish. Looks like he's gonna finish it on a high note. Anyway, Kyle Busch started 40th, finished eighth, and Kevin Harvick started seventh and finished 39th. But uh, on the subject of Kenseth, you know, this would be a great retirement season, wouldn't it? Uh, not a single driver who retired in 2020 got a win. You know, Kenseth, Johnson, Boyer, gone. None of those four actually won a race. So already he's having the best retirement season with the exception of Clint Boyer, you know, with those eight wins. So currently I have a 223-point gap above Martin Truex Jr. in the 19. Then behind Truex by four points is Kyle Busch. Then Ryan Newman, Kurt Busch, Joey Logano, and Harvick. With Harvick's DNF, he, he dropped back extremely far. Uh, and as we switch back to the playoff standings, Byron was knocked out by Matt Kenseth's win. So we now have 12 different winners. You know, it's possible we could get 16. I'm hoping to put an end to all these different winners at New Hampshire because I'm actually pretty good there in this game. But as we look through the playoff running order, well, actually in the point standings, Tyler Reddick is actually having a surprisingly good season in 15th. But how about Chase Elliott? 18th in points, having a bad both mock series and NASCAR heat season. And it's amazing that, you know, of course, he won the 2020 championship. Why can no fake series actually model him having success? So anyway, the next race is the Foxwoods Resort Casino 301 at New Hampshire, and I will see you there.